Hello, um, welcome to this week. We are talking about Virginia Satir and her model of therapy, which has been called a lot of different things in our book. Um, Linda Metcalf calls it the Satir Human Validation Process Model, which is quite a mouthful. It's also just been called the Satir Family Therapy Model. Um, so the main point is this goes along with Virginia Satir. And I am really excited to get to share um, this model with you. Virginia Satir is one of the therapists that I just really loved learning about when I was in uh, my master's program. The first time I saw a video recording of Satir doing therapy, um, maybe embarrassing, it's my own stuff. I just, I started crying. It just was so beautiful to me. Um, I loved how uh, she presented herself and the, the feeling of congruence and authenticity and connection was just really beautiful to me. And that is really key to her whole model. So hopefully you've gotten to watch some of the videos already for this week. So you have a sense of her and we will talk some more about her as we go along. So in the book, it talks about how Satir's model is humanistic and experiential. Um, those are two traits that I also practice as a therapist. Humanistic basically means believing that humans have strengths and capacity within themselves that maybe has been untapped. Um, that philosophy of humanistic has kind of had a lot of iterations. And what Satir meant is that she really believes in people. She sees goodness, she sees um, strengths, she sees value in each person, no matter who it is or what's going on. And she really embodies that. Um, she sees it in herself too. And she talked, in addition to her work with family therapy, she talked a fair amount about self-esteem and some of the ideas from her model get reflected a little bit in one of the models I practice most, which is internal family systems. And we'll touch on that in several weeks um, when we talk about that model. So this image of the fountain is a metaphor that Satir used. Um, you probably saw it, hopefully saw it on one of the videos, um, that longer video where she's talking about peace. And so her view of humans is that they have this, this power, this strength, this light. I, you, there's a lot of different words, soul, um, potential, we might say divinity, whatever it is, we have this inside of ourselves. And we want to as humans, we want to manifest it. We want to be able to be our true authentic self and give what we have inside to the world. And she talks about how, depending on contexts of our family and society, sometimes those nozzles that are like the water fountain, if the water is that, that strength, that um, beautiful human nature, the goodness, the light, then sometimes those nozzles that would express that get kind of pinched. And um, so, so that we aren't able to really express the beauty that is within us. And so she talks about becoming fully human, which means to, being, to be able to express in congruent, authentic ways what is within us. And um, one of the things that she might do if she was working with an individual instead of a family, well, she may do it some with a, with a family um, as she's kind of working a little bit with each person, is to help people recognize the traits and the qualities that they have within them and what is truly self, what is truly them. A lot of times people will come in and say they don't feel... Um, like they, they haven't felt like themselves. They haven't felt like they can be themselves. And that's something that Satir would really want to help people be. Okay. Um, another aspect um, that I talked about, humanistic experiential. So 
Satir believed that we learn things experientially. And experiential learning actually happens all the time from the time we're, we're little and we don't even have full control of our limbs. And so we're kind of like moving our muscles around and our hands are kind of like all over the place. And then we figure out, oh, if I you know, do this thing, it gets my hand in my mouth and I could suck it, that's good. Um, when we're learning to crawl and to walk, we try and make mistakes and then pick ourselves back up again. There's a number of different models of experiential learning, but in general, there's this sense that we do something or we have an experience. And um, then once we've had that experience, there may be success or there may be failure or there may be kind of some of both, but we make sense of that experience. Um, we make sense of that experience and in making sense, we kind of learn. Now, one of the things is that we can learn things, learn things that aren't really true and, and that can go along with trauma. So for example, if as a small child, um, your parents aren't there for you or you have these emotions that are completely invalidated, um, you, you learn that it's not safe to have emotions or it's not safe to share emotions um, or you learn that you are powerless, things like that. And that would be an example of those um, nozzles of the fountain getting kind of crimped so that we can't really be ourselves and express ourselves. But it is experiential learning because we have this experience, we make sense of it, we process it, we sometimes will um, generalize it or conceptualize it how how will this apply in the next my next attempt and then we try it again and you know so this is how we learn kind of outside of maybe scholastic venues but we learn this all the time we learn it in the way we communicate with other people we learn it in riding a bike we learn it in any kind of skill we try it we succeed or fail we um kind of have some idea, we process that, reflect on it, and then apply that and try it again. So when Satir talks about being experiential, or people say experiential learning in Satir's model, um, what she is trying to accomplish in therapy is to give people new experiences to incorporate into their repertoire of how they understand themselves, how they understand the world, how they understand their family members. So um, you probably saw in some of those therapy clips that she would invite people to talk to each other in different ways, or um, she would sculpt them and give them a different, a different perspective and understanding, a different experience of how they are interacting with their people. So um, anyway, that is a, a key part of her model that we're not just gonna talk, 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 talk. We're going to do, we're gonna have these enactments. We talked about that with um, the therapies last week and maybe there will be sculpting. Um, and we'll talk more about that in this lecture. So what she was doing was trying to help people have new experiences with themselves, with others, with the world. All right. So Satir has a lot of wise things to say. Um, and this is one of them. And this is about, so she saw the process of becoming human and hopefully you saw this in some of the videos, but she saw the process of becoming human as being facilitated or hindered by interactions in families. And that if you get this perception from other people that you are only supposed to be a certain way or um, that you have a certain value or something like that, that can kind of pinch off those nozzles. It can keep us from being fully ourselves, becoming fully human, as she would say. And so she said, we, we especially as we grow and as we're adults and as we are being self-reflective about this, she said, don't allow other people's limited perceptions to define you. We can't do that. You need to be able to fully express you. 
Okay, so um, Satir had a number of elements of her therapy that were pretty key. She, in addition to talking about so family therapy, she also talks about self-esteem and then her coping stances or communication stances, which she saw that communication and the way that people communicate comes from how they're trying to cope with things. Um, but that's another key element that she talked about both inside and outside of family therapy. So she had these ideas of four different um, kind of unhealthy or unhelpful coping stances. And then also there is um, another coping stance, which is what she's trying to help people get to, which is congruent. So these different coping stances, um, if you can see in the uh, kind of top left of the screen, it says self, other, and context. So she saw those as kind of the elements that determine which coping stance um, people might use. So in a blaming coping stance, you are, or the person who is blaming is aware of the other um, and focusing on their issues, but is not particularly aware of what's the contextual elements and what, it, what is my part in that. So of course she's systemic. And so she's saying, you know, context is important. Your part in, is it, in it is, is important also. But somebody who has that blaming stance is going to be focusing on the other person's part in it. Um, so potential signs that someone has this coping stance, things that she might listen for, um, the sense of it's their fault. Um, why didn't you do this? Um, there's less responsibility taking, there's challenging and criticizing. Um, she also pointed out that there is a facet of this that can help people be congruent, which is just to be assertive. Um, and so then as you see under there, ways that could help people who have this coping stance or this communication stance get towards being more congruent. Um, could point out that the blaming hasn't solved the problem. So, you know, you can blame somebody else all you want, but if that strategy isn't working to get you what you want, then maybe it's not the best solution. Um, can also do that systemic reframing, help um, the person who is blaming see their part in this, maybe do some of that um, kind of pointing out the reciprocity and the circular causality of a situation. Um, also, and we'll get a little bit more into this later, but if someone is blaming, blaming, blaming somebody else, then um, Satir might kind of deepen, and we'll talk about deepening with other therapies also, but, um, and we'll talk about this with her metaphor in a minute of the iceberg, but deepening just means like understanding what's underneath it and getting to the most human yearnings and, and beauty. So, you know, if, if the blaming person, for example, is saying, you never um, listen to me, you never take out the trash, you never um, help me the ways I need to, whatever that is. Um, Satir might slow that down and say, you know, what I think I'm hearing is that you really want to connect. You really want to know you're important. Am I getting that right? And so by slowing it down and helping deepen, the person is able to kind of reflect on what's going on for me and maybe talk from that level or or help that get resolved instead of the blaming behavior. Conversely, it could do this, um, Satir might do the same thing with the person who's being blamed. Um, you know, I wonder what it's like for you when your husband or your wife just blames you for all of this and, and maybe you could help that person deepen and help that person be able to say, I feel like I'm never enough. I really want her to see that I'm trying hard and it's it's not my intention to hurt her, things like that. So we're deepening and we're kind of going down the um, the iceberg, as it were, getting to what's um, what's underneath the interaction so that then if we can get there and people can actually express what's going on for them, then that's a more congruent stance. 
Okay, placating, um, that's another one. This would be like the person only paying attention to their part, not paying attention to the context, not paying attention to the other person's part. Just, oh, you're right, it is all my fault. Um, I wish I could be better. Oh gosh, I feel so bad. All of that kind of stuff. Um, this, uh, the kind of strength here is that it can be very empathic, um, can be compassionate if you're kind of looking at yourself and not blaming another person. However, um, it also doesn't recognize the whole system. And so it's not congruent. And if somebody kind of victimizes themselves or lets themselves be victimized, um, doesn't actually say what her ideas are, just, oh, you're right, you're right, you're right, then that's not helpful either. So uh, kind of same ideas, um, we can look at it more systemically, we can look at that circular causality, deepen what's going on for the person um, so that that communication can be more congruent. Um, another, both that blaming and placating, other communication theorists have talked about blaming as being like aggressive and placating as being passive and then super reasonable, which is the next one we talk about, can kind of sometimes come across as, pa as passive aggressive. Um, so super reasonable is like if neither person is going to be all that considered we're not going to deal with emotions um we're not going to look at different sides we're not going to recognize the systemic nature of this we're just going to be super reasonable and maybe you've had people in your life like this too um i i see a couple um where, and this, honestly, this could be a lot of couples, but um, many couples, I guess, where the wife says, I just, like, I, when we talk, I want to know what's going on for my spouse. And sometimes I think that he's feeling something and I'll say, are you upset? Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you mad at me? What's going on? And the husband will be like, no, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Um, this, just, this needs to happen like this. And it can be really, um, one person described it as like, it feels kind of like gaslighting. Like she's being told that what she sees and knows as reality is not reality. And um, so it, it's a stance in which there's a lot of control um, because, you know, if you're not gonna admit your vulnerability or your emotion, then, you kind of have this least interest and it's just like nope everything's fine and we're just going to talk about the facts and stuff like that so it's it's logical which is it can be good i mean we, we definitely do want to use that that front part of our brain um and be able to incorporate logic but to deny any emotion is not really helpful either um and so some of the ways Satir might help a person like this to become more congruent would be to show them how those emotions, even if they've kind of divorced themselves from emotions or don't feel like emotions are safe, which is one of the, the reasons people will take this coping stance, um, that emotions are valuable and that the stance that they're taking isn't incorporating some really important cues that they are receiving and the other person is receiving. Um, and that in fact, the emotion can be a benefit. Sometimes people just have a hard time believing that because they have felt really shut down emotionally or it wasn't safe in their family to be emotional. And then the last one is irrelevant. There is a member of my extended family who just embodies this to a T. Whenever things start to get slightly, um, I don't know, tense in the family communication, this person will like 
pull a funny face or sing a silly song. Or if we're texting, they'll like throw in a random meme. <laughs> to me, it's super obnoxious, but that's how this person has learned to cope. When they are not feeling safe, they might change the subject or um, just do something completely different or make a joke or whatever so that we're like, oh, let's not look over here. That looks scary and tense. Let's look over here instead. Um, so that can be great for creativity. You know, we don't, like we have um, learned about in other uh, models, getting stuck can be a problem. And so a person who is irrelevant keeps the system from getting stuck in that one pattern, potentially. They can be creative um, that way. But... Um, but it can also mean that we never really get to focus on what is an issue. And if we never really get to focus on it, even when there is some tension, you know, we can, we can cope, hopefully cope with the tension, but if we never get to focus on it, then we don't get to solve it. We don't get to come up with new solutions together. Um, so anyway, there you go. Those are the different coping stances. And that's key um, for satire and for assessing and for intervening also with families. Okay, we're gonna watch a quick video that has satire showing each of these coping stances. Okay, so um, this is a, a video, um, this is like the second part of a video where Satir is doing a workshop and she has a question from the audience where they say, um, you know, I live in a small town and it's quite conservative and your work trying to help empower women who are being battered is not actually that popular. And so in my small town, we have a battered women's shelter and women are taught to be more assertive and to stand up for themselves. And if their husband keeps um, hurting them to leave. And so what do I do with this? And so Satir um, started with a congruent response, but then she said, now, wait a second, let me show you all of these possibilities. So we are going to um, watch these and see if you can tell uh, which is which and, um, yeah, we'll go along. They're they're kind of funny. Now, I just want to do this again, and I want to do it another way. Uh, so, would you start out and tell me what you've been hearing? Okay, Virginia, we've been hearing. No, you're. I'm Glenn. Uh, you're Glenn. Glenn. <laughs> We've been hearing about these uh, women that uh, go down there to the center and they're getting filled with all kinds of ideas about how they're just as good as their husbands and that they um, can get off and do their own thing and they don't have to pay any attention to marriage vows. No, we no. just really don't like that. Oh, I feel so bad that there's anybody like that who would talk, who feel that way. That's terrible. Maybe we should change everything we're doing. I'm so sad about that. Uh, I think you'd ought to be, because that's sure what we hear is going on. Oh, gosh, I didn't really know. Oh, forgive me. I would never have done anything wrong. No, you sure have been. You going to forgive me? <laughs> not that easy. No, not that easy. Now, that's another whole string of affairs, isn't it? <laughs> but you know that one. I right, do it again, I'm going to do another one. <laughs> Same thing, you know, just something same thing. Okay. Glenn, you know, we really don't like the way you've been doing things down there at that women's center. You sure created a mess out of a lot of marriages. Who in the hell do you think you are? <laughs> down there with all those crappy people being a righteous son of a bitch? <laughs> Go on, chuck it, brother. <laughs> That's another one, isn't it? Possibility. And that I could get a knife drawn on me. For that one. <laughs> okay. All right, do it again. <laughs> we'll do another one. Uh, Glenn, you 
you've really been tearing up things in that self-help center down there. Uh, all that you've been doing has wrecked so many homes. It's uh, gotten so many women all upset. They're off doing stuff that, uh, you know, running away from their husbands and their kids. It's great that you asked that question because I just happened to have a report from the National Institute of Mental Health in which there are several statistics of of groups in the country where there is a great deal of husband beating going on and I think that you would like to read that so I think you will be more informed when you read it. Thank you. <laughs> I, I already know all I know and all I need to know. <laughs> all right now do it again. I'm gonna do another one. <laughs> you notice everyone sends it in a different direction but do it again. Glenn, I'm really upset with the way things have been going down there at the center. You've been taking a bunch of this new human psychology stuff and turning it loose on these women, and you've really wrecked a lot of them. <laughs> oh, God, in heaven, I knew one day somebody would like come up. You know, that reminds me of a joke. <laughs> you don't really care about that. And I can do that. You recognize that. Or I can do what I did before, or I can do another one. Say it to me again. It's another form of making a connection with him at the same time, trying to do something which may, which doesn't escalate what he's doing, but may create a little doubt. Me. So tell me again. Glenn, this kind of stuff that you've been working with down there at the center just really is doing a lot of damage. You know, you're tearing apart families, you're tearing apart homes, you're getting women with all kinds of modern ideas that aren't good for them. Uh, we really, you really ought to be doing something different. You ought to do something about that. We've got a lot of people that think it ought to be stopped. You know, let me have your hand. How do you feel about that? One of the nicest things that anybody can do is to share what they feel. And I feel you've done that for me. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're together in what we're doing because I don't know if I understand completely what you're saying and I don't know if you understand completely with me but I really like the fact that you've taken the trouble you have taken the interest to be able to share this with me can we talk further about it I'd sure like to okay. all right so um that was the three or the five communications dances. Of course, the first one was placating. Just, oh, I'm so sorry. I would hate for anybody to think badly of me. Will you please forgive me? It's all my fault. And then there was the blaming um, where she's just laid into him. Um, and then there was super reasonable where she's like, well, here's a pamphlet that you could read about this. And then there was irrelevant and she wanted to tell him a joke. And then finally it was congruent. Okay, so um, a reflection question for you um, now that we've looked at those stances, which communication stances do you notice in yourself? And do you use different stances depending on the person that you're talking to or the context, context or do you have one that you notice that you kind of do a lot. Um, a lot of people that come in notice that they blame themselves for a lot, of, a lot of problems. And that guilt and self-blame can lead to um, a, a placating communication stance. Another thing I see a fair amount is that people get really angry. And when they're angry, uh, often they will be blaming. Anyway, another one, uh, another kind of piece of this reflection question, once you've kind of noted maybe what your stances are, what, what tends to be something you use, and whether that's different for different situations, is what's going on for you underneath when you use that stance? So I'll tell a story on myself. One of the things that I have noticed is when I I'm communicating with my husband when things are not going well and I'm you know, just things aren't going well I tend to blame I get mad at my husband well if you had just done this for the kids or why didn't you or whatever it is um, and 
since I got some some training and therapy, I was able to slow it down, kind of understand what's going on underneath myself, underneath the, the communication. And now I have said to my husband, if you notice that I am kind of blaming you or I'm just upset with you, just know that what's really going on for me is that I feel like I'm failing. And so I'm kind of like reaching out, trying to like find something that will keep me from failing. And um, since being able to communicate that and being able to recognize it, when I find myself getting into that pattern again, I can stop and just think, okay, what do I feel like I'm failing about? And instead of blaming my husband, how can I lovingly and congruently recruit his help and also take some responsibility myself and say, okay, what do I need to do in this situation? All right. So I mentioned that we would talk about um, this iceberg, which is another metaphor uh, that Satir used. And this metaphor, not in exactly the same form, but we will talk again about this, about deepening, about getting to what's underneath when we talk about emotionally focused therapy. It's, it's a little bit different, like I said, but um, a very similar concept. So on the top, we have just what's observable, what people see from the behavior. And what Satir said is, that's not all there is to it. There are, of course, um, thoughts and feelings and beliefs and all these other things that are underneath that. And given that she sees humans as wanting to do good, wanting good things, when she sees behavior that's maybe not um, effective or healthy, she assumes that something good is underneath it. So, um, you know, there's the behavior and then she might look at, okay, what, how is that behavior a reflection of the coping that this person is trying to, to do? Um, and so she might identify, and this would be part of assessment, might identify those different communication stances. Um, and then what is going on underneath the coping that is the reason that the coping needs to happen? What are the feelings underneath? And there's two levels, there's feelings and there's feelings about feelings. Feelings would be like primary feelings, like joy and sadness and fear and surprise and excitement and anger. But then those secondary feelings are kind of the responses to the primary feelings. And maybe, for example, if you have been taught that it's not right to be angry, um, maybe it's immoral to be angry, then if you feel angry, you might feel guilty about it. Or maybe you have learned um, from your experiences that it's not safe to feel um, excited about something because that's, you know, that shows that you're invested. And if you demonstrate your excitement, then people will somehow take advantage of you for that. And so maybe if there's some excitement, then there's shame about having been excited that, you know, that makes you vulnerable. Um, so there's that, that feelings level. Then even below the feelings level, she put perceptions, meaning the way that we perceive things is going to, um, to create or to inspire the feelings that we feel about them. So um, perceptions are beliefs and assumptions and values and thoughts and ideas. So for example, if, um, you know, if, if your value is, or one of the values that you hold rather, is that we don't drink alcohol and you see um, one of your kids, maybe they're a grown kid, maybe they're 21 drinking alcohol, maybe you feel really sad or shocked or surprised and then you feel really guilty about not having done enough as a parent. Now, if that's not your value, if you think it's fine to drink alcohol as an adult, then if you see your adult child drinking alcohol, it's no big deal. You don't have the same um, 
feelings about it because you don't um, think that it means the same thing. You don't have the same appraisal. Um, then expectations come even below perceptions and expectations then kind of create these perceptions. Expectations can be expectations from other people about yourself. Like um, I expect that I will teach my children to um, love God and to know right from wrong and to keep the commandments. That would be an expectation. Maybe I expect that not only that other people expect that of me, but I expect it of myself too. And maybe I expect of my children that they will um, kind of exemplify and, and show what I have taught them. And so then that also uh, impacts the perceptions that we have. And then yearning is that's the kind of the deepest that we go with emotionally focused therapy. It's what all humans desire. It's what we long for, what we want. We want love. We want to be connected. We want to feel appreciated and safe and known. We want to be trusted. We want to be happy. We want to express ourselves and through creativity. Um, we want to have some sense of independence and of being able to be ourself as well as being connected. And um, then she saw those things as an expression of that, that core, that self, um, which, as I said before, could have a lot of different words to describe it, spirit, soul, life force, core, wisdom, um, in internal family systems, it's called self. Anyway, um, so as um, Satir is working with a family and working with each individual in the family. She's looking for all of these. What's going on underneath the surface? And um, in the eight minute video clip, which um, is, is a clip of therapy, it uh, has bad, bad video quality, but she talks to the people about what's going on. It's two sisters, particularly. Um, actually, I don't know if I put this in there. Anyway, if I didn't, it's two sisters talking. Satir is meeting with the whole family. And she asks, is there something you guys want to work on as a family? And the younger sister says, well, I don't feel very close to my older sister. And I'd really like to feel closer to her. And I think the problem is that she's the oldest. And so she's got a lot of other stuff going on. And she also kind of has more power in our relationship. And so I don't know how to get what I want. And then Satir turns to the older sister and kind of says, what are you hearing? And how is this for you? And the sister starts to cry and says, I'm just exhausted. And Satir looks at that and says, I think what you were hearing was some blame. I think you felt like your younger sister was saying that you've kind of failed her in some way and that's painful. And the older sister was like, yeah, that is how I feel. So um, that ability to really tune in to what's going on for a person is something that's important for all therapists and Satya really does it a lot. Um, when we do emotionally focused therapy, you'll see Sue Johnson does very much the same thing. And she also, like Virginia Satir, leans in and just wants to be close. And both of them are a little more touchy than we often get to be in therapy now because of ethical issues and stuff like that. Um, but just really seeing what's underneath it for the person, really hearing um, what their, their yearnings are and what their fears are and things like that. Okay, so a little light humor. One of um, Satir's famous sayings is, we need four hugs a day for survival. We need eight hugs a day for maintenance. We need 12 hugs a day for growth. And um, so <laughs> people are saying, hey, I don't even get close to getting that. And especially at this time of COVID, oh, we do not get enough physical contact. We don't get enough hugs. 
Now, I don't know. I mean, that was that was kind of Satir's idea. And she, like I said, is a very physical, warm, embracing person. You saw it just in that video, too. She gave her hand. Um, she just was constantly touching people. Um, anyway, I like I said, I really appreciate Virginia Satir. And, and when I learned about um, her model and this this saying, I thought, my kids need more hugs than I'm giving them. And I'm, I'm always happy to give hugs to my kids, but they don't often ask for them or they don't just come up and spontaneously hug me. One of them does, but not all of them. And so we instituted family hugs at the end of our family prayer um, in the morning and in the evening. And so I know that kids are getting at least some hugs every day. Okay, another component of Satir's model is this change process. And of course, all of the different models have an idea about how people change. And this is kind of a visual portrayal of what Satir talked about. So we start with homeostasis or the status quo, what people are comfortable with. And of course, even if they they, they know it in its status quo, like we talked about with systems theory, that doesn't mean that it's healthy. It doesn't mean it's very sustainable. It doesn't mean it feels comfortable. And yet, because it is known, it is sometimes people will cling to it and not want to change. Um, I had somebody in therapy once say to me, you know, it's even though this characteristic that I have is really difficult in my marriage it's served me for my whole life and I'm not very good with change and I don't really want to change it so that is this resistance you know we've got the status quo and if somebody's going to try to come in and change things uh, yikes please don't you know don't shoot me down into this um chasm where I don't know what to expect and I don't know if I'm going to be able to come back out of it um so it's pretty normal for people to have some resistance to change. And that's, you know, because of that status quo, that homeostasis, also because people often just don't know what is coming. They don't know another strategy. They're doing the best they can. And so if you try to, you know, push them forward or push some change or suggest some change, then that's scary. So there's some resistance. And then it's like this free fall into if you, you know, if you say I now can't do my coping stance of being super rational and ignoring all emotions, then like emotions are going to overwhelm me and I have no idea how to cope with them. And this is chaos and super scary. And so that chaos ensues. And um, Satir, Virginia Satir, and then there's another guy who also does experiential called Carl Whitaker. And we're not going to do his model. There's just too many models to, to do them all. But um, chaos was something he embraced. It was like, if, what's, if the problem is getting stuck, then, you know, we've done that that like a river running through and one side is structure, but rigidity. And the other side is um, flexibility, but then chaos. He was like, if we're over at rigidity, we're going to throw, throw them into chaos. And then we're going to pull the pieces back together again. So yes, there is definitely like, whoa, we don't know, like the rules are changing and our communication stances are, we're trying to change those. And um, our relationships and we don't know like how are we relating to each other now so there's a lot of just like change and chaos um, but then in the process of therapy new strategies that have that work better or are more congruent um, new relationships new rules all of these start to come in so those are the transforming ideas and then as people start to integrate and create some more structure again um, around these new ideas. So this is like second order change. We're not just doing more of the same. We're actually having new thoughts, new um, ideas, new strategies. Then that integration happens and we reach a new status quo, which as you can see is hopefully at a higher level or a healthier degree, healthier 
um, way of interacting and way of being and um, healthier relationships than we were before. Okay, so um, in assessment, it talks in your um, textbook about how Satir would potentially do some family mapping. I have not heard about that before Metcalf mentioned it. Sorry, I've got some, something in my eye. Um, and I have not seen, I've watched a number of Virginia Satir sessions. Um, you can buy like master's series or you can watch sessions of like these, the people who created these models. Anyway, I haven't seen her do family mapping per se, not specifically not in as formal a way as a genogram or a structural map. But she might kind of take the family history, find out, oh, you know, in three generations, um, the grandparents of the kids or the, the parents of the adults, how did they cope? Um, what were some of the things that were going on for them? Uh, what were their various stances, communication stances? So to kind of be able to see, like, how is that coming down? Um, into the family system. Then ingredients of an interaction. So like I mentioned, um, as we were looking at that iceberg metaphor, as, as the family's interacting, she's gonna slow them down and she's going to notice the coping stances um, and deepen that. And so as she is talking to the family, she's assessing what's going on. Um, another part of the assessment might be the rules of the family system about communication. So those coping stances and the way they're interacting um, is not just individual coping, but also there's probably some family structure around what is expected and what is okay. So maybe um, it's okay to be a placator and it's not okay to be a blamer. And so there's lots of placating, or maybe it's not okay to have emotions at all. And so people are super reasonable with each other. So she looks at the, those family rules also. Okay, uh, another quote from Virginia Satir, uh, life is not the way it is supposed to be, it's the way it is. So there's that acceptance piece, right? We talked about acceptance and change. She's saying, it is like, even if it's not what you want, it doesn't help to deny what is, it just is the way it is. And then this kind of sounds like some of the other models too. The way you cope with it is what makes the difference. So um, in solution focused, they talked about the problem is not the problem, or the, sorry, the person's not the problem, the problem is the problem. And the problem is, whatever was used to solve the problem. Often the solution itself becomes the problem. Well, Satir says the way that you are coping with the problem can become the problem. All right, so experiential interventions um, that Satir used, and I'm gonna show you a little video of some of these two, or well, one of them particularly. So the biggest one, and we've talked about this, um, with you know the very beginning of the class with systemic and then self of the therapist. And we've talked about it some with the other models also, how models reflect the character and the person of the developer. But Virginia Satir was just, has this presence that in itself created a new experience. Um, she just loves people and she just wants to connect and the way she looks at people and like gets close and um, holds their hand or touches them or whatever, that whole presence can be a new experience for people that they are being seen completely and that, that the therapist is very congruent. And so it invites them to be congruent also in the way that they are interacting with each other and um, and just to be seen and valued and held and and all of that can be just a really powerful experiential uh, intervention. So the next one, Satir loves metaphors. I like that about her. Um, so family sculpting, which is also a spatial metaphor. 
Um, and that's what I'm going to show you. Sculpting is something that I do a fair amount in my practice also. And um, the therapist might at like Satir might have asked people, like maybe she heard, maybe a mom says, you know, I've got this, um, this kid and my kid is into these things and I want to support and help them, but my spouse was really upset. In fact, this was, I think, one of the um, therapy session snippets that you saw where the mom is like kind of being pulled between the dad and the, um, the son. And so probably Virginia Satir would have said, you know what, let's, let me, let me see this. And so she probably placed the mom between the dad and the son just so that she could really have the experience of being pulled both directions. Um, but another thing that can be used with um, sculpting, the family could sculpt how they feel in the relationship. So like how close and far they are and kind of the, the various stances that they have. Another one is enactment. Um, you probably will have seen this in one or two of the therapy snippets where um, she has people turn to each other and say what they want. Now in um, narrative and in solution focused, when there was an enactment, it was more like, let's go over what happened and then we'll sculpt a new way to have that interaction. With, um, satire and EFT and enactment is more about so they don't have you do it the old way they'll try to get you deep and deep and deep into the bottom of that iceberg and then be able to express it to the person um, in a totally new way like what is my real desire my real desire is to connect with you that's what I really want I really want to feel safe in our relationship something like that so that again is a new experience to hear these deep yearnings from somebody instead of just being at the behavioral level. Um, parts party is very similar to IFS. Um, it's where you recognize all the different parts of you and their interactions. So this could be done with an individual. It could also be done in a family as you're looking at one, one member of the family. Um, self mandala is where all the different um, people in your life and their different expectations, your different roles, all of those things get represented by various people, or you could do it with um, little models or something like that, so that you can be able to see what's going on. And in seeing it in a new way, you're having a new experience. Um, back to use of self, touch was very important um, for Virginia Satir. And again, that like giving somebody her hand or putting her hand on their shoulder, things like that were an opportunity for a new experience. Um, she could also facilitate congruent emotional expression. And then that kind of goes with the communication um, enhancement, helping people be congruent. And that can also kind of go with the enactment that she helped people as as she deepened with them and saw them clearly um, she could help people express what was really going on for them and to be congruent in their communication and have that experience multiple times in session so that hopefully they could take it home they could learn that it actually is safe to be congruent it is safe to say what's truly going on within you and what you really want and yearn for and then that opens up new possibilities in communicating and gets people unstuck from those old um, incongruent communication stances. Um, slowing down interactions to examine the ingredients of the interaction would go right along with that iceberg metaphor and these other things where instead of just um, looking at the content of the interaction, like what's what people are talking about or like the specific behaviors, um, she would be looking at the process underneath that, the individual process, the family's process, how the different um, coping strategies are interacting with each other. And she would 
comment on that, ask people how it felt, ask them what they wanted. And then softening family rules, again, is about um, changing the, um, the stuckness, the, the coping strategies that have gotten the family into a, an unhealthy status quo or homeostasis and um, helping them really process why do we have that rule? Could we change that rule? Would it be okay for each person to communicate and interact more uh, congruently? Authentically, that would be another way to say it. Okay, so there's a, a brief video that we will watch about, about sculpting and so that you can kind of get a sense of how powerful it could be in therapy. Um, okay. Okay, so we're actually gonna watch this a little bit faster because we can and she talks rather slowly, I think. A mother called a child guidance agency asking for someone to see her six-year-old daughter to treat what the parents saw as the child's misbehavior. Intake noted the family included mother, father, six-year-old girl, and two-year-old boy. A clinical social worker called back and invited the parents to come in together with their daughter. When the parents and little girl arrived, the social worker welcomed them into a cozy room with several chairs and a sofa. The parents took the sofa and the little girl huddled in a corner chair. The social worker first asked the parents to talk about their goals in coming to the agency. Then the social worker turned to the little girl and wondered if she would look over the figures on the table and choose ones to show her family. The child picked out four figures. Then the social worker asked if she would show how it feels to her in the family right now. And this is what she did. But don't you have a cat? She asked wistfully. The social worker found another small object and handed it to the little girl who moved it quickly to her side. Then there was a short pause, and then the mother crossed the room and put her arm around her daughter, saying, honey, I had no idea you felt so alone. You can see how in just a few seconds, the child shows through family sculpture how alone she feels. The sculpting reframes the presenting problem for the family. A mother called. Okay. All right, so that was a little example of um, what sculpting might do and how it can show things in a way that might take longer. Um, if you're, <coughs> pardon me, just assessing with words. So a quick reflection question for you guys. Um, looking at those experiential interventions. I wonder which you would probably use as a therapist and why. Um, what would you use most? What would you use least? So um, look back at that. You decide what, what would you like to be able to do? What would maybe feel uncomfortable for you? And the sculpting, as I said, can be done with models like was shown in that video, or it could be done with the family members themselves. And when I do sculpting, I usually do give that first prompt of what does it feel like now? And then I give another prompt of what would you like it to feel like? And I have, especially if I'm doing this with a couple, um, if it's a large family, I can't always have everybody do their own. But if it's a couple, I'll have each person do um, do one of those sculpts. And um, then I ask the other person, how is this for you? What about this um, sculpture that your spouse has created fits? What doesn't fit? What's uncomfortable? What would you want to change? Uh, so that way it isn't too overwhelming. People say they can have a voice because sometimes sculpting something can actually feel quite overwhelming to people. It's a very powerful experience. Okay, a case study. So we have here, oh, I don't know if you can see what it says for the dads, but um, we have here at the bottom right, Sarah, who is 20 and a psych student in university. And she's had eating problems and eating disorder since she was 14. 
Then we've got Jane on the bottom left, um, Sarah's mom, who also experiences anxiety and hates pressuring Sarah to eat more. And then on the top, we have Patrick, who is Sarah's dad, and he thinks that his wife, Jane, should push Sarah more. He feels like she is kind of caving in to the um, eating disorder. So we're going to listen to a conversation that this family has, um, and then we will um, talk about assessing and intervening. Yeah, so I think I had enough bread to say. You have anything to say? All I have. She might be hungry later. Patrick, just, you know, you've got to leave her alone. She's actually old enough now to know when she wants to eat. You don't have to worry. I'm going to eat lunch now. I'm going to eat lunch well, I'm not always hungry in the mornings. Sometimes I don't feel like eating in the morning. Listen, you don't have a problem. Well, but Sarah has a problem at the moment. She needs to eat properly. But I think that what you have the problem. You don't realise. The more you go on at her, you do. The more you're going on at her, the worse you're making it. It's enough to put her off of that. Can you just, can you believe me? No. What, what do I need to do? Will you get something later? Will you get my, come back with my empty bag? What do I do in the day or what? Your Jane. I think you're making it worse. I think the pressure that you're putting on her under is making it worse. Honestly, Patrick, you've just got to listen to yourself. It's, it's okay. incessant. It's yes. Every meal time, it's thank incessant. you. Well. No, it's incessant. Every meal time, you see, she knows. She's, she knows that she's got to put a bit more weight on. She's done really well so far. She's tried putting weight on, but the more you're going it's on. It's not working, Jane. Well, it's just not working, and you sort of. Oh, I can't stand it. I need to go. I, 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 I say things as they are. It's not that I'm taking sides. I just see it you know, from Sarah's point of view. Exactly, you're taking her side. I just think you're handling it badly. You're not handling it badly. You need to be a little bit Dad, objective. Please, you should do something. I think you need to see things. I think you need to see things from Sarah's viewpoint. Quite honestly. Thank you. Okay, so we heard that conversation between Sarah, Jane, and Patrick. Um, at breakfast time. You could hear some of what was going on. And now we will look at sculptures that the family might create. Oh, hang on a second. Okay, so here's the family sculpt. Um, so this is this um, one on the left is Sarah, the 20 year old's sculpture. She has her arm around mom. She's close to mom. She has mom looking towards her. And she and dad have some distance between them and are looking at each other. So it looks like there is kind of some recruitment of help from mom and, um, and that she kind of feels like she and her dad are facing off a little bit. Um, you might also, maybe a word that comes to your mind is triangulation, um, where mom and Sarah have kind of this alliance, and this has become part of, potentially, of the, either the couple or the executive, if we were talking about structural. Um, then Jane, this is mom. Now you notice mom has actually sculpted Sarah between her and Patrick. And um, mom has her and Sarah looking at each other and holding hands. Like she's really trying to be in it. Again, we see this alliance. And she sees husband also as distant, but as covering his ears, um, like, he doesn't want to hear it. He's not paying attention. Um, mom maybe is seeing dad as blaming, but not willing to listen to the context, not being willing to consider some things. And then Patrick, you see here, he has his arms open. He doesn't see himself as trying to blame. Um, he sees himself as trying to plead, trying to, to help things go better. And he again sees Sarah and Jane um, separate from him, sees mom as trying to comfort and take care of and nurture Sarah, um, probably a stance that he saw, like this looks like a stance a mom would take maybe with a younger child um, where there's that nurturing instead of Sarah standing on her own two feet. 
and he again sees mom as focused on Sarah, not looking at him, not considering him. So in each of these, everybody has has sculpted mom as paying attention to Sarah, not paying attention to dad. Everybody has sculpted dad kind of on the outside of this. And Satir might ask dad, what does it be like? What is it like for you to be on the outside of this, to have Sarah and Jane be close and allied um, and you not really be part of it. And he might talk about how he really wants good things for Sarah. He really wants her to be better. And he's afraid that um, Jane is kind of caving, that she is being a placator, um, that instead of acknowledging Sarah's role and in the eating disorder, she is just saying, oh, you know what? We can't blame her. We need to take the blame on ourselves as the parents. Um, particularly, she is kind of blaming um, dad. She said, you talking like this will put Sarah off of eating. She doesn't tend to blame herself, but she may see kind of the parental subsystem, if we were going to talk about it that way, the kind of the parent's role more than she's willing to acknowledge Sarah's role, maybe more than she's acknowledging the whole context. So let's go back to assessment. Um, so that first, that first piece of the assessment would be about communication stances. Um, it does seem that Patrick is, is kind of pointing a finger. He isn't necessarily seeing what his role might be. He is seeing both Sarah and Jane as having a role in this. And he's maybe not considering the context, which is how difficult it is to overcome an eating disorder. And he's not considering maybe some of the systemic elements that are part of that. Um, with with um, Sarah, Jane might be in a more placating stance. She might... Um, be saying, yeah, I, like, I know you're, you're trying to do everything you can. It's definitely not your fault. Probably something that we could be doing better as parents. With um, Patrick, she seems to be in a more blaming stance. Um, I didn't hear a lot of irrelevance and I didn't hear a lot of super reasonable in this family. Um, it sounded like Sarah, the daughter, um, was maybe doing some placating with her mom. No, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, I'll eat later. Um, but it didn't sound like she was blaming. Um, anyway, so another thing that Satir would potentially do if she was going to do some family mapping is to talk about um, mom's anxiety, to talk about if there's any other eating disorders, to talk about what kind of communication they saw in their families growing up. Um, how did their, how did Jane and Patrick's parents handle tension or controversy or stuff that was going on that was rough? Um, and um, then kind of looking at, oh, maybe you do some of that the same, you know, some of those things similarly. And then maybe um, looking at Sarah's behavior, how is Sarah's behavior um, of not eating or of having this eating disorder about her needing to cope? What are the feelings that are underneath that? What is it like for her to see her parents be kind of at odds with each other? Um, what are her perceptions about herself? What are her expectations of herself? What does she feel like are her parents' expectations of her? Um, maybe Jane and Patrick have different expectations of her. What does um, Sarah feel like are society's expectations of her? Maybe there are some conflicting expectations like it's not okay. And maybe some of those feelings that come from perceptions of like, it's I feel guilty about or I feel ashamed of having this e eating disorder. It's not okay to have an eating disorder, but at the same time, 
um, I need to feel more in control of my life and I'm supposed to be in control of my life. And people expect me to be in control of my life and in control of my eating, but I don't know how to do that. And so this eating disorder is about trying to take control. Maybe the eating disorder also has some element of societal expectations about body shape. Um, so there's some of that there. And then the yearnings, what does each person yearn for? We talked about this just briefly. Maybe Patrick yearns to be, um, to feel like he's a good father, um, to feel connected, to feel like he's acceptable and loved. He, maybe there's, um, if we get back up to feelings, maybe there's some shame about his daughter having um, an eating disorder maybe um, there's some perception of having an eating disorder means there's dysfunction in the family and um, maybe even that dysfunction in the family is my fault or maybe the perception is that dysfunction in the family is my wife's fault and then he has some expectations so so um, Satir would be looking at all of these and would be maybe helping sculpt the family if you know, maybe they take one of those sculpting stances themselves or maybe she helps them get into it and then she would have them turn to each other and say, um, this is what I really want and this is what I'm afraid of. So, um, you know, maybe in one of these stances, she would let dad do an enactment and share what he wants, share how scared he is maybe of losing Sarah or how he really wants to feel connected and he feels on the outside of this family. Uh, he feels like he isn't considered, he feels like, um, like his thoughts about how to support Sarah because what he really does want is to support Sarah aren't taken into consideration by Jane, things like that. So these experiential interventions, maybe um, Virginia Satir would also do a parts party with Sarah and help her talk about how she has these different parts that um, have different ideas. Maybe there is a part of her that really, really wants to get over this eating disorder and maybe there's a part that needs the eating disorder because it doesn't know how to cope otherwise or it doesn't know how to feel in control otherwise um so being able to kind of break that out um she would of course be right in there with the family holding people's hand touching them on the shoulder linking them to each other um facilitating that communication. So maybe after a parts party, or maybe um, Sarah wants, to, or she could have Sarah do a self mandala where she talks about the different roles she has and the relationships that she has kind of outside of herself, um, then that would help the family have another experience again of seeing all these different um, aspects, all these different parts of Sarah's life and how she's trying to manage them. And um, then that could facilitate some more communication so that hopefully people would be communicating authentically, congruently, um, having new experiences and being able to see each other in new ways. Okay. So that is um, the end of this lecture. Maybe went a little bit long. Um, but I will look forward to meeting on Friday to talk about this some more, get any questions that you guys have answered, um, case conceptualized with the Lee family. And if you guys could bring some of your conceptualizations uh, about the Lee family to the um, lab, that would be great. And um, you guys all helped with that last time too. Um, I'll have you guys be conceptualizing, be talking about some of the communication stances you might see in the Lee family, um, how the change process might happen. Um, also, what people's experience with, it, um, with being congruent and with being able to really express themselves is in that family and ways in which they might kind of pinch their nozzles for each other or ways in which the context or the situation has kind of pinched those nozzles closed. So I look forward to that and 
Um, hope you guys have a great week.